live from Washington, D.C., it's theCUBE, covering AWS Public Sector Summit. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services. Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage of the AWS Public Sector Summit here in wonderful Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, John Furrier. We are, we are welcoming Dave Levy to the program. He is the Vice President, Federal Government at AWS. Thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is your first time, your first rodeo. It is my first time. Welcome. Yeah, glad to be here. You're now so, a CUBE alumni. Welcome to the CUBE Alumni well, Club. exactly, <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, so, you have been with uh, AWS for about two years now. AWS famously has this day one mentality. I want you to talk a little bit about the culture uh, of the company and how, and how the culture helps create more in innovative products and services. Yeah, and it is always day one. You know, you hear about that, but truly working in my first two years, you really get the experience when you're here every day, that, that excitement and that enthusiasm for customers. You know, it's interesting, somebody was asking me the other day, how do you get influence inside of Amazon? How do you get your points across? And in large part, because Amazon's not a, a PowerPoint culture, uh, being charismatic or having some of those traits really doesn't carry the day. What really carries the day inside of Amazon is what customers want. And so I, I can't tell you how many times in the first few years that I've been here that we have been in meetings going through our customer working backwards process where somebody has said, you know, wait a minute, we heard customers say we prioritize these four things versus these three things. And that kind of, uh, that kind of sentiment carries a lot of currency inside of the business for what we prioritize and what's important to us, and it's how we innovate on behalf of customers. So that's what happens every day. It happens day one at, at AWS, and it's been really exciting these first it's few years. It's been a great formula for Amazon's the long game, as Bezos always says, Andy always says, you know, customer first, customer centric thinking. Yeah. But this working backwards process we've learned, come to learn, it's very, really critical within Amazon. Yeah. But also making sure customers have the right journey, right? They get what they need, they get value, lower costs, eliminate the undifferentiated heavy lifting. I feel like I'm messaging for Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> I got memorized there. I've said I've interviewed so many people from Amazon, I got the wrap down. But digital transformation is about the long game, because the shifts that are going on now aren't incremental small improvements, it's really moving the ball down the field, big time. So you're seeing major shifts within customer bases, saying, like the CIA did in 2013, sure. which was initially a hedge against big data we heard on stage today, turned out to be a critical decision for their innovation, this modernization. Could you share some other customer experiences around this IT modernization trend? That's, it's totally real, it's happening right now in sure. DC in public sector. Sure, I mean, there are a lot of examples. I mean, IT modernization is something that, you know, it takes on a lot, of different, a lot of different forms and a lot of different agencies think about it in different ways. But fundamentally, it's about taking the systems that are serving citizens or a warfighter and allowing for an ability and an agility to do things better and faster and cheaper and uh, doing it in a way that continues to, to innovate. And you see a lot of examples of that. I mean, you know, we see CMS has uh, the uh, 76, 76 million records of, of Americans on AWS. Um, you know, you see large data sets starting to be hosted on AWS uh, from agencies across the civilian sector. Uh, DOD is, is really starting to lean in on, on workloads that are things, uh, traditional things like ERP. So, uh, DOD is more than leading in, they're yeah. really going big. <laughs> well, I, the I think there's a- The paper that they put out was yeah. very comprehensive yeah, in Yeah, I their think there's a, a, a tremendous advantage from this digital transformation. And agencies are really just at the beginning of it. They're really beginning to see what flexibility it provides. I think the other thing that it's doing is it's really helping to modernize uh, the workforce. It's allowing the IT workforce to start focusing on uh, things that uh, that are really valuable instead of managing hardware or, or, or managing I, uh, IT environment strictly. It's giving the ability to deliver solutions. And that's really exciting. That's what modernization is you doing. You know, one of the things that comes up in the modernization conference is not that obvious on the mainstream press, but the whole red tape argument of government process. Yeah. You know, people process technology. We think we've done these conversations all the time. But in each one, the process piece, there's red tape in all of them. 
people who go slower, the process has red tape in it, but this idea of busting through and cutting the red tape, yeah. all these bottlenecks, Teresa calls them blockers, yeah. right? That's her yeah. favorite word. Yeah. <laughs> these are real, now they're, yeah. people are identifying that they can be taken away, not just dealing with them. Your thoughts and reaction to that? Yeah, well I, I agree. I mean there's a lot of opportunity. There's, you know, digitizing workflows gives you the opportunity to re-examine all of these operational processes, which frankly may have been in place for, for very sound reasons in the past. But when you modernize and you digitize and you do it in a cloud way, you're going to start to see that some of those things and those processes that were in place really aren't necessary anymore. And um, it allows you to move faster, gives you more speed, and uh, we're seeing that across, uh, across customers in the U.S. government. We're seeing it really everywhere. And one of the things you were saying too about the digitizing the workflow, it's really about ensuring that citizens, civilians, or members of the armed forces are interacting with government in a more meaningful way. I mean, that is the overarching problem that you're trying to solve here. It is, and it's, it, it can be as simple as uh, citizens getting the kind of content that they need from a, a modern website, accessing it quickly, um, going to higher level functions around chatbots and things like that. So these modern cloud architectures are allowing agencies to deliver services faster, to deliver things to citizens in a way they haven't before. It could be citizens that need assistive technology. Um, it's giving the uh, agencies opportunity to do things around 508 compliance that they haven't done before. So it, it's really opening up the aperture for a lot of agencies on what they can deliver. We've been doing a lot of reporting around JEDI, the DOD obviously been following a lot of the white papers from a cloud perspective. We're not really in the political circle, so we kind of don't know sometimes whose toes we're stepping on when we kind of poke around. But one thing that's very clear from the agencies in our reporting, even here in the hallways this week, CIA and other agencies I've talked to, all talk about the modernization in context of one common theme, data. Yeah. Data is the critical piece of the equation and it's, it's, it's multifold. It's single cloud with the, with the workload objective or multiple clouds in an architecture like the DOD put out. So there's kind of clear visibility on what it looks like architecturally. Multi-cloud, some hybrid, some pure public cloud yeah. based on workloads, the right cloud with the right job. People are kind of getting that. But data is evolving. The role of data, because you got AI which is fed by machine learning, this really is a game changer. How is that playing out in conversations that you're seeing with customers? Talk about that dynamic because if you get it right, good things happen. If you get it wrong, <laughs> you could be screwed. I mean, it's, it's really one of those linchpin core yeah. items. Your thoughts? Every agency, virtually every agency we talk to, every customer we talk into, talking to is, is saying that data is the most important thing. Their data strategy and data, you know, we've all heard the sayings, I mean, data has gravity, data is the new oil. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to characterize it. But once you have the opportunity to get your data both unstructured and structured, in a place, in a cloud, in an environment where you can start to do things with it, create data lakes, you can start to apply analytics to it, uh, build machine learning models uh, and AI, uh, then you're really starting to get into uh, delivering things that you haven't thought about before. And up until then, that's been, it's been tough because the data in a lot of our customers has been um, spread out. It's been in different data centers, it's been in different environments, sometimes it's under somebody's desk. So this idea of data and data management is really exciting to a lot, a lot of our customers. Now a lot of people don't understand that there's also down, this is what we, again, we're hearing from customers as well, is that they set up the data lakes, whatever they're calling it, data strategy, or data lake, whatever. Then there's downstream benefits to having that data that just materialize. And you know, as, a, as an anecdote to it, as you look at the ground station yep. effort, we've had a couple great interviews here about ground station, which I, I love by the way. I think that's like yeah. totally like the coolest thing because of the, what the real impact is going to be. Great backhaul, IoT is going to boom, blossom from it. But it only happens because you got Amazon scale. So again, data has that similar dynamic where as you start collecting and managing it in a holistic way, yeah. new things emerge, new value emerges. Yeah, I would what say- What are some of those things that you're seeing with your customers I, there? I would say there are like real world challenges that our customers have to deal with with data, right? When you, when you start to have volumes, terabytes, petabytes of data, 
uh, they've got decisions to make. Do they, do they expand the wall, knock out a wall and expand their data center and buy more um, appliances which require more heating, more cooling? Maybe they do do that, but there's also there's an alternative now. Uh, there's a place for that data to go uh, and be safe and secure, and they can start doing the things that they want to do with that data. And like you said, downstream effects, there are some things that they can do with that data that they don't even know about today, right? Uh, and uh, and ground station's a good example of that. Uh, you, know, you talk to people in the military, for example, because we just had Keith Alexander on general, the yeah. general's on. You know, they think tactical edge, using data, save lives, protect our nation, et cetera. But there's also the other benefit of it that has nothing to do with the tactical, it's the business value. The enablement is a huge conversation sure. that you hear in these modernization trends. Mm -hmm. Not just the benefits tactically, but the enablement set up. Talk about that dynamic. Well, you think about the data that, that, uh, that is collected. I mean, you think about the valuable data at the VA and, and that has uh, you know, potential implications for population health. And, and so this, this day is just enormously valuable. I, I think we're at the very beginning of what we can, what we can do with some of these things uh, across, across federal civilian. I mean, you look at agencies like Department of the Interior and some of the data sets they have are, are just fascinating what we can do. We've got you know, millions of visitors to our, our national parks every, every day and uh, those, we don't know what's possible with a lot of those data sets. Talk about some of the tools and techniques that, you're be, that are being used to work with that data and talk about AI and machine learning and how they have been a real game changer for some of your federal customers. Well, you know, ML and AI is really, uh, we're really at the very beginning of this transformation. I mean, I think in the fullness of time, the vast majority of applications are going to be infused with machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I think that, that day is, is not too far away. And they're using tools on our platform like SageMaker uh, to uh, make predictions in this data. And uh, one, of the, one of the great things about having a platform that has really three different parts to the stack, which are you know, machine learning, that's where you have your frameworks. I say that's where, that's where all the really, really smart people live, all the data scientists that, uh, that we're also desperate for. And then you've got that middle layer, which are tools like our SageMaker, which everyday developers can use. So if you've got geospatial data, and you're trying to determine um, you know, what's in a given area, you can, everyday developers can use SageMaker to build machine learning models. Those are some of the things they're doing, very exciting. Hey, I want to get your thoughts on a comment that Teresa Carlson just made earlier today. Um, I think, I'm not sure she said this on camera or not, but she was, it was memorable. She said, it used to be an aha moment with the cloud, but this year it's not, it's, it's real. People now recognize that cloud adoption, this legit, Proof is in the, the new normal. It's, it's the proof is in the pudding. It's right there. You can start seeing evidence. Yeah. You know, all the doubting uh, people out there can now see the evidence and, and make their own. It's clear. Yeah. Cloud is a great benefit, creates disruption. As this continues to increase, and it is, numbers are there, see the business performance. What are the challenges uh, and drivers for uh, yeah. continued success? Yeah. I think the first conversation starts, so Teresa's spot on, as she always is. But I think the first conversation starter is always cost savings. That was the way everybody thought about the cloud um, in the beginning. And I think there are cost savings that, your, that customers are going to realize. But I think the real value, the real reasons why customers do it is, you know, there's an, a, there's an agility that happens when you move to cloud that you don't necessarily have. Um, in your other environments. There's the ability to move fast, to spin up a lot of capability in just a few minutes, in just even minutes, and uh, change the experience for these, for users, change the experience for citizens. I think the other thing that cloud is delivering is this whole breadth of fun functionality that we didn't really have before. We talked about machine learning and AI, but there are uh, tools around uh, IOT now. Uh, there's uh, Greengrass on AWS, which is simply um, AOT, uh, AWS IOT inside. And um, you know, places like you know, John Deere, we have um, th hundreds of thousands of tel telematically enabled tractors sending data back to planners. So customers are getting involved because there's this huge breadth of functionality. I think 
And, and so that's exciting. Those are the enablers, those, that's what's driving. I think some of the things that are getting in the way is we've got a workforce, by and large, especially in the federal government, well, this is new. And uh, that learning is happening, that enablement is happening about cloud. Uh, we're teaching about security in the cloud. It's a shared responsibility model. So it's, it's, a, it, it's the new normal. We know it's, what can be done in the cloud, but now there are some new paradigms about how to do it. And uh, AWS and a lot of our partners are out there uh, talking about how to get that done. I want to get uh, a double down on that because one of the things that we're doing a report on and investigating is um, kind of a boring topic, but it probably hits your world right on, which is how Amazon bare knuckled their way into this market, you know, through cost savings from the federal government. Obviously, it's a great, great lead because they care about cost savings. A financial institution in, in Wall Street might not care about cost savings. They might want arbitrage on the other side, but yeah. again, government's government. You guys have earned, done the work to get all the certifications. Your team, Teresa's team has done that, and now you're at the, the beginning of the next level. But procurement yeah. is really broken, right? I was talking to a, uh, an official um, on an interview off the record, and he said, I won't say his name, but I can say it here. He said, you know, we're living procurement in the 80s. We still have a requirement to ship a manual yeah. on a lot of these, these things. So the antiquated, inadequate procurement process is lagging so much sure. that the technology shifts are happening in a shorter period of time frame. Amazon introduces thousands of new services every year at reInvent, Jassy's biggest slide, yeah. thousands, next year it'll be probably 5,000, who knows? It'll be a big yeah. number. That's happening, all this is happening right now really fast, but procurement's like lagging behind it really stunting the innovation equation, yeah. the growth of innovation. Your thoughts on fixing that, how you get around it, all these old tripwire rules. Well, first I'll say, you know, uh, procurement reform is something that's on everybody's mind. I mean, this is, you know, it's not just, it's not just a blocker for cloud, it's a, it's a blocker for everybody. I mean, technology is far outpacing what our federal government can do. So I don't, there's nobody that I talk to that thinks that we're headed um, in the right place with procurement reform, um, even our customers inside of, um, in, in, inside of the government. So I, I, think, I think what I'd say is it's really a collective approach. It's an industry approach that's going to be taken to, to change uh, a procurement to help them adapt modern laws. I, I, you know, do we need changes in the FAR perhaps? Yes, but I think we need fundamental policy changes, legislative approach. Uh, to change procurement for technology. It's only going to get, it's only going to move faster, you're right. Uh, Andy announced in 2018, I think, nearly 2,000 services. So you can expect there's going to be more this year. Um, part, part of that is understanding new models. Um, our marketplace, for example, is a way to buy and access software quickly, fast, um, even by even by the hour, if necessary. That's a total, Like ground station, yeah, in that way. It's a total, yeah. By the minute, yes. if necessary. Yes. So it's yes. a totally new paradigm. As far as how we're approaching kind of uh, now, um, it, takes, it takes having good partners. We have good yeah. partners that are helping us with respect to contract vehicles. Yeah. Um, I think we're being, we're being transparent around how we bill, how these services translate, what's, what's in the services that they're getting charged. And I think agencies are starting to feel more comfortable with that. I learned a term from Charlie Bell, the um, engineer lead for Amazon, did an yeah. uh, interview, a term you guys use internally at Amazon called dogs not barking. Yes. <laughs> and it's a, it means that everyone, the, dark, the barking dog everyone hears and they, yeah. they, they, they yeah. go out, they look, solve that problem. It's what you don't see, the blind, yeah. AKA blind spots. Yeah. What do you see in federal that's not barking that yeah, you're aware what, what of? Are our dogs? What keeps you up at night? <laughs> what are our dogs not barking? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would say, I would say it, it really is our customer um, workforce. I think our customers really need to get uh, enablement and training and support from us and the partner community on how to make this transition to cloud. Uh, and it's incumbent upon us and it's incumbent upon the agencies to really deliver that. That does keep me up at night uh, because it, this is new. Uh, this is new for uh, the ATO process is a little bit different. The, uh, the uh, accreditation process is different. So there's a lot of new things out there. And if, I, if there's a dog that's not barking, it's somebody needs help and they're not really they letting us. They don't even know they, they need it. They don't know they yeah. need help right. or they're not saying that they need help. 
and uh, and they don't know where to go. Right. That's great. They, they well, should thanks come for to coming you. On. <laughs> Dave, thank you so much for coming on the Cube. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank All you. right. I'm Rebecca Knight for John Furrier. We will have more from the Cube AWS Public Sector Summit. Stay tuned.